starting to think about the house where the left and right and other, maybe there's like a green caucus, maybe like that's real, that's thing. And that if you're going to be speaker of the house, either as a Republican or Democrat, you have to put together a coalition. And by the way, like you have to put together a coalition of these people somehow. And that's that's breaking the duop duopoly in the house because it's suggested. I also think structurally it's much easier if you were to actually intentionally go about pursuing that strategy, there's an easy, because you only will need a few targeted congressional wins to do that, right? And it's hard. It's still a huge line. But because it's like a targeted system and there are districts where you could do that, or likewise, by the way, the threat of doing that is enough to push a current Democrat because they're responsive to their electoral needs, where mm -hmm. they know if they're not that, they're going to get primary from the left successfully, by the way. Let's be clear. I think that's part of the problem. A lot of the time people are like, I'm going to, like, this person will lose. I'm going to prim primary them. Like, they have no real power to do that. And the threat's a joke and everybody knows. It. So structurally in the House, I agree with you. I think the problem with that in a presidential context is the system, our system, which I would like to change the structure of, mind you. So I'm not a fan of the structure, but our system, which is a combination of several factors, including things that I'm going to say that we both don't like, like first past the post voting. That sounds like a Democrat problem. If Democrats don't want spoilers, it sounds like they should really advocate for getting rid of first past the post voting. First past the post voting. Uh, first past the post voting. Second, um, uh, what's it called? Um uh, the electoral college makeup and the fact that the election is thrown into the House of Representatives, which when that procedurally, just to be clear about that, when an election is thrown into the House of Representatives, it's voted on in a very weird way where every state delegation gets one vote. So California gets one vote and and uh, Becca Ballant from Vermont gets one vote. Um, but that means all those like little Republican states get one vote and all the big Democratic states get one vote. So therefore, you know, Democrats are kind of at a huge disadvantage to that if, if an election is thrown in the house. And my only other point to you on this, which is a side topic, is, you know, frankly, if you I actually disagree with this when it comes to uh to elect. I disagree with it in both elections for some structure from for some like research points, but you've reached a point twice in the past, twice in the past 25 years, right? A Democratic candidate has lost, if you talk to like, let's call it the blue, let's call it the like vote blue, no matter who that crowd. Twice in the past 25 years, a Democratic candidate has lost to a Republican candidate because people voted for a third party candidate. Now, I don't agree with that. I'm just saying what they would say. You, you, they, they would say that, right? They would say Al Gore lost in 2000 because of Ralph Nader. Al Gore lost in 2000 because the election was stolen in Florida. There's just no doubt about that. Like there's no, there's no thing and they would say hillary lost because people voted for jill stein which also yeah, is we know, we, we're real familiar with the arguments all right Ari, so but i'm saying i'm saying they fundamentally believe that argument right so they fundamentally believe they have lost because of spoiler candidates and what has been the reaction to losing because of spoiler candidates in the next two elections nominating more moderate folks i don't care ari they're gonna lose again and again, because I know what the difference with me is between now and in 2016, is that today I don't have even a moment's hesitation and anxiety, insecurity, embarrassment, or anything about proudly voting for a Green Party or a third party candidate, not only in a state like New York or D.C., but I swear to God if I lived in Pennsylvania or Ohio. And I have family in Ohio and will strongly encourage them to vote their conscience in a swing state in Ohio because the playing nice didn't get it. They lied about the extent that the third party cost Democrats those elections, because if you add up one, there are more libertarians that voted for that would have if you're if you're doing this metric that libertarians would have voted for Republicans and Green parties are votes belong to Democrats, which is crap. But that's the logic they're using. So if we apply that logic, the libertarian party gets way more votes than the Green Party. Yep. Second of all, if we want to if we want to talk about the 2000 election, more registered Democrats in Florida voted for George Bush, then Ralph Nader got votes in Florida. So if you're mad about if you if you're curious about like who was actually entitled 
Democrat votes, voters that the Democratic Party were entitled to, per se, that actually expressed an interest in being Democrats. That's what you had going on. Right. But in, I'm, what I'm saying to Florida. you is like, I, we don't, by the way, we don't disagree on the reality of the situation. So, so if, it's, it's never been our fault. If, if their response to losing these elections is that it's our fault, then let them keep saying it. That doesn't do anything to me, but I am emboldened to make it Im impossible for them, Ari, to win an election without soliciting our votes. Now, they might decide to keep losing elections because they would rather lose an election then do the overwhelmingly popular policy prescription that the green that the left is asking for. But the, the left's job is to make it clear that that is a choice that the Democratic Party is making. The Democratic Party is choosing Donald Trump over Medicare for all. But my my only point back, my only point back is actually my point back. I made my structural points. We yeah. can put that to the side. My point about Congress is what we came on here to talk about is is there is a real there, like what the Freedom Caucus is doing now, structurally, is a real path towards real power in a way that, like, look, I, where you and I disagree, and I think we just have the disagreement, and it's like the structural disagreement is I actually think the reaction to Democrats, to, to Democrats losing a presidential election is they're just going to double down. So I don't think that's a path to real power. That, that does nothing. I'm not a Democrat. So them losing and doubling down is not my political party. My goal is to grow my party, not to continue to protect the Democratic Party. Right. So that's not what I'm suggesting. My, okay. my question is, how do we build power to get the stuff done that we want? Right. That's that's my question. And to me, I see that what the Freedom Caucus is doing right now, right, is a legitimate path to legitimate power that has that has a way for progressives to take it. It's not a distraction. Like, look, I'm also not down with like the the stupidest stuff that the the that crowd does is the vote shaming stuff. Like, you know what? That just backfires. Nobody's gonna be shamed into voting. Like, we certainly are. You're, not. A, you're a bad person because that's not gonna ever. Like, you you like you do have to make a case to voters to vote a certain way. What I am saying is a path to real power on. Like, if you look at what the Freedom Caucus is doing right now, what the Freedom Caucus is basically saying is we are kind of a separate caucus from the Republican caucus. We're in coalition with them. We're never going to join the Democratic caucus. But if you want to get anything done, you have to go talk to us. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I'm suggesting is, is, is anything we can do as as leftists and progressives and anybody on, let's say, people who want to accomplish some of the policy aims that we want to accomplish ultimately, right, is convincing, not convincing, creating a political situation, because no one's convinced, convinced is too nice, creating a political situation where members of Congress feel like they have to, like a certain block of members of Congress feel they have to coalesce around a block of progressives. And if they, you know, two. Well, well, Ari, the the problem is there's no block of progressives, so there's no body in Congress who is willing to force anybody to do anything, because when, when the, the Kevin McCarthy stuff was going down, instead of being humiliated that they didn't do what the Freedom Caucus was doing two years before, the squad members wrapped their arms around Hakeem Jeffries, who spent their entire life and their super PAC money trying to unseat all of them at one point or another and, 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 and waxing philosophic to the mainstream news about how united they were as a party and how much they stood behind their leader, Hakeem. So that, that's it. I, I don't need to see anything else. Those people, and they're not all equally frustrating to me. And some of them like Rashida Tlaib have had their good moments with the um, uh, railroad strike and stuff like that. Look at Ilhan on foreign policy. I don't think I, I think you No, Ilhan on foreign policy. But I also I have I have seen her like shaking like a leaf, like a deer in headlights, trying to make these brave stands on various things and getting shut down by her own party. She shouldn't be in that party. She, all every single this is what's so heartbreaking. Every single one of them has been abused by the Democratic Party. We saw Nancy Pelosi say something to AOC on the House floor that made that woman break down in tears in front of the entire country. On that Israel vote thing. Yes. Yeah, I always, I really want to know what was said there, by okay, the way. Okay, but AOC won't tell us. Because AOC has made the decision, made the decision at the time to protect Nancy Pelosi 
over using that moment to expose how craven the Democratic Party is. They, they've been doing this over and over and over again for the last two years. They have chosen their side and they've chosen the Democratic Party for whatever reason. Maybe they sincerely think they can get things done with the seat at the table inside. AOC just gave an interview to Jen Psaki where she hinted at her Senate run. Can we just go back to something I said at the beginning of, of our conversation, which is you asked me like, you asked me about like, could this be, we were talking about, could this be replicated? And I said, I think if the Freedom Caucus, if Donald Trump were president, and this were the same situation, the Freedom Caucus wouldn't be pulling right. the same shenanigans. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's the, the dynamic switch in the last two years is, do I think, do I think the free, do I think like if, if this were reversed, would the Freedom Caucus be, do, be doing the exact same thing, kind of the progressive caucus and squad members doing? And the answer is absolutely yes. And how I- Okay, then, then great. Absolutely. That's all I need to know, Ari. All I, That's all I need to know about the strategy of working inside, electing squad members, the Justice Democrat strategy. That's all I need to know. If the strategy only works, if people only pantomime fighting when the other party is in the White House, which limits how much they can actually accomplish, then I am not interested in that as a political strategy. And that I think that reality is part of why so many people are wanting to divest from the Democratic Party altogether. Well, that's why people, the, the reality that Washington generally and politics generally can't get anything done substantially on either side, by the way, like for the most part, um, like Republicans can do tax cuts, kind of. Uh, the Supreme Court can deliver something for one side and something for, meaning under, like, the Supreme Court delivered gay marriage during Obama and the right freaked out. But Ari, I don't think the lesson is that they can't get anything done. I think the the lesson is it's not them deciding that gets things done. It's outside movement efforts that get things done. And the argument that people are making is that all of this energy is being diverted into let's elect more squad members, let's do more than the Democratic Party, when there needs to be a, something that genuinely pressures these people in any context, no matter who's in the White House, to do the thing that the people want. Right. But I think the genuine, the, the problem that's faced in this is the genuine pressure. And I'm not saying don't pressure. I'm saying the genuine pressure among Democratic voters at large is to put on the, the genuine like sentiment among Democratic voters at large in this do it is regardless of what I believe personally and what I'll tell a pollster when they call in, do I support Green New Deal and Medicare mm -hmm. for all? Do I, do I support this? Is the general sentiment among that group of people, which comprises, you know, let's say it's basically 45, 45, and then there's like a percent in the middle, but they aren't really swing voters. They're, do they show up or do they not? But the general sentiment among kind of party line voters is m my jersey, the color of the jersey I wear counts more than the ideological. Yeah, standpoint. and that's that's the job that we're doing here right now, Ari, and why I so appreciate you being willing to spend this time with me and have this conversation is that part of the, the fidelity to the team is believing that the team is really fighting for you. And Democrats have done a really good job and their acolytes, like those little TikTok boys or Olivia What's Her Face, who does what I don't know exactly what, but is very loud on Twitter about how amazing Biden is. It doesn't matter. These people are irrelevant. But the 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 they they're when you look at the tenor of their tweets and their public statements, it's all why Biden has done enough, why Biden did his best, why the Democratic Party's party was obstructed by people outside of the party, but it's never the party's fault. It's the blame game at the most elite echelon, a, a blame deflection game. And my job, and what I'm so grateful to you and people like David Sirota, et cetera, for is helping to explain how these mechanisms work so they can't say it's the parliamentarian's fault, it's this person's fault, it's that person's fault. We now know because of you and people who are insiders and know better that it was a choice to take the $15 minimum wage out of that must-pass COVID bill. And that that was a choice made by Chuck Schumer with the backing of Joe Biden. We know things that were that 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 we could have had, but for choice not choices that corporate Democrat. Sorry, it was a choice not to fire the parliament. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. It was a choice not to fire her. So I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful for you spending this time here with me. We have to wrap. I just want to ask you one last thing before we go. Um, briefly, you know, what do you make ultimately of um, Bernie Sanders endorsing Joe Biden the day that he announced, and AOC now endorsing um, Joe Biden? at this stage in the primary process? Look, I think, and this is, you know, 
I think fundamentally, this is this is the structural problem that I brought up and where, you know, I feel like if you are a the kind of standard, not standard, if you were even a progressive congressional Democrat, right? It's the it's the obvious move. And frankly, it's less of a, you know, you're gonna do it anyway, so why not do it? Why is it the obvious move? Because the structures of our political process make that the obvious move for both Bernie and AOC. Why is what does that mean? Because because well, fundamentally, Bernie Bernie believes, right? And he said this, so I'm not like quoting him, and I haven't spoken about this, so I'm speaking just what I know about him. Bernie believes that Trump is an existential threat. He legitimately believes that, right? And Bernie be- and Bernie sees that, and I can just un- just understanding being around him a long time and not knowing what it is, but Bernie would say that structurally, Joe Biden's the candidate, so I'm just going to support him because. But Joe Biden isn't the candidate because we're in a primary season and there are two other people running against him. That's the problem. Bernie, look, I wouldn't agree with Bernie endorsing Biden once he's a nominee, but it's a hell of a lot better to say, well, I'm a Democrat or I caucus with the Democrats and I'm going to vote for the Democratic, I'm going to not, I'm going to endorse the Democratic nominee. Then in the primary process, when he was once the insurgent that nobody had any confidence in, In a primary process, when nobody asked you, you could have just sat quietly for 10 months. Well, that's the thing. He couldn't have sat quietly because here here's the that's that's the he could not have sat quietly because the reason he couldn't have sat quietly is because if he didn't. And I'm not saying this is you're you're going to reject this completely. I know the rejection. We've been friends long enough. I know the rejections, coming, (laughs) but he can't sit quietly. Only reason he can't sit quietly because every day when he's in Washington, he will walk through the Senate tunnel from his office to the Senate to vote. And in that tunnel, there will be a gauntlet of 200 reporters. And every day he doesn't endorse Joe Biden, every question he's going to be screamed at in that corridor is, why didn't you endorse Joe Biden? And the moment he endorses Joe Biden, the moment he endorses Joe Biden in that corridor, do you know how many questions he gets about the presidential race? Zero. So, so you're, the idea you're telling that, me, Ari. I'm not so saying that's we, why he did it. You, asked, have, you just said he wouldn't be asked any questions. We have poor working class people out here knocking doors in triple digit heat and in the freezing cold of Iowa and during the primary season. We have people who are uh, social workers uh, and housing attorneys and organizers and mu- mutual aid servicers trying to hold this country together with spit, glue, and love, working hard family suffering, struggling with rent that's gone up 500% over the last 20 years. And the reason that Bernie Sanders Not the doesn't want to hold out. No, no, that wasn't the reason I was responding to. He would never, he could sit silently. I was just saying he can't sit silently. The pressure of getting some media questions in the hallway in the Tony Senate offices, I would submit to you, is not going to come off as a good excuse not to hold your ground and offer offer tacit, not even explicit, but tacit support for people willing to challenge the Democratic Party in the exact same way that he so valiantly tried to do in the last two election cycles. It's not an excuse. He's just, I was just responding to the, he won't get asked about. He could sit quietly. He can't sit quietly. He had to say something. He should, he, what he should say is that I respect, I respect a primary process. I think that Joe Biden should allow there to be a Democratic primary process and I will withhold my endorsement until the primary is over and we have a leader, but it's a democracy and the voters should have an opportunity to decide who they want. You and I, you and I both know that party primaries are not democracies. Like, yeah, I mean, but whatever. I would love it even more if Bernie took the opportunity to say exactly that. I have been the victim of a rigged primary and I am not going to participate in rigging this primary by prematurely giving my support to a candidate who is unwilling to have a genuine primary contest. Look, I think <laughs> I think Bernie sees the structural. Like you asked me why, I think I yeah. gave you the. I think he sees the structural pressures of the situation and makes a choice based on that. And AOC, I think the same thing. I, I think they both see the the internal structural pressures and make a choice based on that. And you can disagree with that and and obviously you do and look i i think the the mistake people make and i think what bernie hasn't done right is he also hasn't shamed marianne he hasn't said marianne 
should, I don't know if he said anything about RFK, but I know I know on Marianne, he hasn't said she should drop out. He hasn't shamed her. He hasn't been like, right. she's damaging. He hasn't done that. I'm not saying that's the ideal situation, but the point is a lot of people are there being like, you're destroying her. And Bernie, I, he's been asked, and he kind of refuses to take that bait in that way. Um, look, and I also think there's, you know, uh, I I think, I look, I, I really do think it comes down to the structural issue I laid out for you. Like the reason for like, and I also think, look, I think there is a perception and I'm not saying, I know, I know I'm about to get yelled at for stating what I think a perception is, but I think there is a perception that if people, especially among progressives in Congress, that if they were if they were like doing the elementary school report card on Joe Biden, right, they would mark him as exceeds expectations for them. And part of that is what their expectations were. I I love that. <laughs> part of that was what their expectations were going in. But I do think I do think they feel like like they've gotten more than they thought they were going to get out of him. And to that, Ari, I say more. Yes, but exactly the point. That's. And that's good for the process for people to be saying more. I think, I and I think there shouldn't, like, I, I think activists should always be pushing insiders. I, you know, there are activists who on the campaign are incredible, were incredibly angry at me for a variety of reasons, rightly, wrongly, whatever. I'm not even getting into those debates. But you know what? In the end, I served in a senior position on the presidential campaign, and that means that means they have a right to be angry at me and I have mm. to like take that in, right? It, it is, it, we would live in a better country if people felt more pressure from the outside, right? And that's like, I always, I will never kind of, I will make like structural critiques and saying like, I think this is a better way to power, right? But I'm never going to critique someone's motivations for their attacks because, you know, we need to, we need as a country, we would be better off if there was a real, if there was real pressure on people all the time, if politicians felt real pressure. And the truth is, politicians, regardless of who they are, be it Ilhan Omar, Bernie Sanders, AOC, uh, or Josh Gottheimer, right, the kind of most conservative member of the Democratic Caucus, right, you went either side. Politicians are responsive to real pressure. And, and and bad pressure backfires on them. That's just the truth. And they are, every single one of them is somebody who's, whose primary job in life, regardless of whether they even subconsciously or consciously, this is true. But every politician I've ever encountered fundamentally understands their job in life is to get reelected, right? Or, or that's, and is that right? No, but that's how they, that's how every politician thinks. That's why they get elected because they fundamentally are driven by that idea. And I know I know you have like quotes from every single one of them saying, I would lose the election, da, da, da. And interestingly, like, you know, there are moments in careers where they have done those things that they think will get them unelected and often doesn't. But most politicians, and by this, I mean most, I mean 99% of people who run for office, once they achieve office are self-preservation. That's just, and so- Yeah, so and that's just, that's, I'm sorry, that's unacceptable to many of us. And that's unacceptable to people. I'm sorry, I have heard enough listeners to this show on the call-in and when I meet them in real life say that they are completely disinterested and uninvested in whether or not AOC or any of the others get to keep their $175,000 a year salaries. They resent it, in fact. They're uninvested, they resent it. But, but then the question is, the question for me is, you can, you can be unresented. You, you can res sorry, you can resent it. You can be unsympathetic to it. Which you, by the way, everyone should be unsympathetic to it because that's their goal, not your goal. Right. Right. You can be unsympathetic, but then the question is, and this is like what, what K Street is good at. What, what, frankly, like organizations like Democratic Majority for Israel, are good at. Right. What those elements that that 
cause a lot of issues in the system for progressives are good at is weighing pressure on the other side of this. So the question I have long-term and structurally that I think the left has to confront is how do you create pressure on the other side of that question? Yeah. And I think a lot of folks have answered that by saying, I'm no, I, I just not going to participate in the Democratic Party anymore. And if the Democratic Party believes it can win without me personally, I would like one of my goals is to is to make black people stop doing the Democratic Party. I'm just laying out on the table. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for five dollars a month at patreon.com slash bad faith podcast. That's patreon.com slash bad faith podcast for five dollars a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.